So let's take a look at our calendar. So today, December the 8th, uh, we talk about fractals today and Wednesday. Today and Wednesday are our last two days of material. Uh, one week from today is the, our last class. It's a review day. So again, this week will be the end of the new material. And then a week from Wednesday, December 17, is our third test. It is only on what you see projected up here, the stuff since test number two. Uh, coming up on Wednesday, finance project is due. So it looks like I've gotten at least two of them. Maybe some other folks are making good progress on them, but it is due on Wednesday, okay? Any questions on the calendar? Okay, so done talking about finances, totally changing gears here on page 28, talking about something called fractals. So let's uh, go with uh, Brendan, are you on page 28? Number one, please. Thank you, Jeff, number two. Okay, thank you. Jen, 3A. Koch. Koch Snowflake. Go ahead, Jen. Okay, everybody understand what happened there? We started with this equilateral triangle. Equilateral means what? All well, sides are equal, right? You can actually see like equi, equi, equal, and then lateral has to do with sides. So we start with that triangle, and then to each of the three sides of that triangle, we append, we add on a little miniature equilateral triangle. And that little mini triangle is going to be, is going to have a length uh, one third, whatever the original was. You see it? So right to the middle, we add a new equilateral triangle on every side, and we get this guy right over here, and uh, this has 12 sides, apparently, like all of these guys count as sides. So 12 of those things, right? Looks kind of like a snowflake. Okay, uh, let's go to Megan for C. Okay, so now we're starting with this thing highlighted in green up here. And on to each of those 12 green sides, we're going to tack on a little equilateral triangle. So, for example, that triangle right there is the one that got tacked on up there. You see it? So again, to the middle third, we add another triangle. And so this new guy down here, step two, has a whole bunch of sides. I don't feel like counting, but you guys will during the activity. And then we keep going. And so um, if I wanted to go one more step, I would take, like, for example, this side. And what would I do if I were going to the next step? would add an equilateral triangle. Where on that side? Right in the middle. And how long is the new side of the equilateral triangle going to be compared to that red one? It's going to be a third, because we're always going to the middle third. And so we would just add this cute, tiny little triangle right there, middle third of that side. And we do that all around, right, on every one of the exposed sides. OK. So part D says the first several iterations are below. So we've got our seed, the original triangle. And then step one, two, three is the new one for us. That was the one that I, I drew one little teeny tiny triangle on. And then step four is over there. And let's go to uh, Christopher for E. Sarah, four. Okay, so let's go on to number five. Uh, let's go to Anthony. Uh, 
Okay, so we're gonna yeah we're gonna write down a guess in just a second, and this is not a group thing. I just want an individual guess. So assuming that the original seed has a perimeter, how do you find the perimeter of a shape? We add up all the sides. So if the perimeter is 27, I guess that means nines all around, right? So that perimeter is 27. Um, what happens to the perimeter here? Bigger, smaller, or the same? It's a little bit bigger. You see that? That perimeter is a little bit bigger. And then as we come over to this guy, maybe a little bigger still. And so it does get a little bit bigger at each stage. We're going to continue this forever to infinity. I want to know, what's your guess? If the original guy has a perimeter of 27, what do you think is your guess for this like theoretical actual last one? So just write down a number. That is your guess. You don't need to discuss. Just take 10 seconds to reflect internally. Make a guess about the perimeter of that last snowflake. Okay, just another couple of seconds. Even if you have no idea, write something down. Anything down, just commit. Okay, everybody has something written down? Let's take a look at number six. We'll go to Ricky. Okay, so now we're thinking areas. So we're going to assume the area of this guy is 35. What about the area of the step one snowflake? More or less or equal to 35? Definitely more, right? Because we added, literally added three little triangles. Because uh, you can see the original guy is still in there. That's still 35 plus the, the three extra triangles. And then whatever you get there, um, I think that that you can say, well, we definitely added more stuff to the 12-sided snowflake. I got confused here. What am I doing? There, 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 there. Yes, so there's my 12-sided snowflake plus a bunch of extra triangles around the edge. So the, the area definitely gets bigger every time. So if the area of the original is 35, getting bigger, bigger, bigger every time to infinity, think for 10 seconds. Don't, don't talk amongst yourselves on this one. Just write down some number for the area of the infinite Koch snowflake. If we could do this process forever, what would happen to the area? Okay, write something down. Even if you have no idea, just make a guess, commit to something, write something down. Such pained expressions because I'm asking you to write down a number. Okay, let's uh, just get uh, some guesses. What did we think about the uh, perimeter? What did we say for that? Just shout some numbers out loud for the perimeter. Out loud with your vocal cords, they vibrate, sends sounds through the air. 270,000 for the perimeter. Wonderful. Other numbers? 81. Other numbers? 61. Fantastic. Anybody have anything bigger than 270,000? Five billion. No fooling around. 54. Okay, so we have a pretty wide range of guesses for the perimeter of this thing. How about the area? How loud? Infinity. Infinity is okay as an answer. All right, so Sue Ann thinks the area approaches infinity. Sam, 35,000 square units, 37.5. And again, we've got a pretty wide range of answers here, but I, I mean, like these huge numbers seem reasonable. Like, clearly we're adding stuff every time, so it feels like really big if we do it forever. Okay, we will answer those questions in a little bit. Uh, seven, Sue Ann. Okay, so um, so we can see here, uh, like part of a, of a Koch snowflake after many iterations, and if we just zoom in, like literally zoom in just on that one part and then expand it, what does it look like over here? It looks quite similar and maybe exactly the same as what we had. And then if we look at this little teeny tiny thing and, and, and zoom in on it, then it sure looks pretty similar to what we had. And, and like really think about what, what this thing was. It used to be like that 
like just that, yes? Right, like you zoom in on that and it becomes this, which becomes this, which looks an awful lot like the original guy. Okay, so here's a uh, very short clip from YouTube. So, uh, let's see, that was number, okay, that was seven. So who's our reader for eight, Megan? Or sorry, Monica? Thank you, Jackie, nine. Okay, so here are some things, uh, many of which you are familiar with. What is uh, this first thing here? That is a fern. Everybody recognizes the fern, right? Now, if I were to just take one part of this thing and zoom in on it, what would it look like? Like if you just saw like that, would you say, oh, that's a fern? You wouldn't say that's a part of a fern. You'd only know it's a part because you see this big picture. But if you just zoomed in on one branch, you'd say, oh, look, it's a fern, right? And if we had enough pixels, and we were able to zoom in on that thing right there. So, oh, look, it's a fern, right? So this is this kind of idea. There, there are many things in nature where if you just kind of keep zooming in, keep looking in, it looks the same. <clears throat> um, all right, so this thing right here, yeah, it's kind of a, yeah, it's a cauliflower broccoli cross. So it is a vegetable. It is edible. Apparently, it's quite delicious. Um, it's called the, there's the name, the Natalino Romanesco. And it's got all these crazy, like, bumpy things on it and if you just zoom in on like one part of it like if you had the ability to zoom in on that thing I think I do have the ability to zoom in on that thing okay, yeah. it's been in my back pocket all semester uh, so if we had better pixel quality we would, we would look at it and say oh that's that crazy plant right you wouldn't know it was just part of the plant because if you zoom in like over here you can see that it kind of just keeps looking like that as you zoom in more and more Anybody know this bottom left vegetable? That's fiddlehead, right? It's another kind of fern. It's also edible. And again, it, so it's got this kind of crazy shape, but if you just zoomed in on that one piece, you'd say, oh, it's a, it's a fiddlehead fern, right? Like you wouldn't say that's part of one. Um, I can't tell what this guy is. Like it's, I think it's ice, but it, it might, is it ice? Yeah, so like ice breakage. And, and, and to me, this looks like a very zoomed out view. But if you were just to, you know, kind of like zoom in on that thing, it would probably look quite similar, right? It wouldn't be exactly the same, but I, I wouldn't know that I was far or close. It's just self-similar. And then finally, lightning. Like this looks like a whole branch of lightning, but if you just saw this part of it without having the big picture, you'd say, oh, it's just lightning, right? You wouldn't say it's part of lightning. Lightning has this kind of self-similarity structure. Okay, so the activity here begins on the next page. We're going to start it together and then you guys are going to work in your groups. So uh, part A says you're going to draw a seed triangle, which means in the center of the triangular grid paper, which is on the next page, you're going to draw a seed triangle where each side is length nine. So here's triangular grid paper, right? You guys have a lot of practice with square grid paper. So triangular grid paper, you're going to make a seed triangle with length nine. And what you want to do is probably start someplace in the middle-ish. Maybe I'll start with my top guy there. And then you're going to count very carefully nine in each direction. I think I've got that right. And then you go nine straight across, right? So just pick one point that's not quite at the top, but just a few rows down maybe. Somewhere in the middle. And then count very carefully nine on each side. If you have a straight edge, that might help you. You can use the folder or maybe a calculator or a notebook. And once you've got your nine drawn in, your seed triangle, you're going to go back and answer the questions B through H. Right. So once you've drawn in your seed triangle, some of you are using pen, very bold. So once you've got your seed triangle drawn in, go back to the previous page. You are working through B through H. 
Okay, everybody back up here, please. Can I ask you guys to jump ahead to page 33 momentarily? Page 33. And at the bottom, you're going to ignore that big chart for a minute, but at the bottom, starting at number eight, are some conclusions about the Koch snowflakes. So I suspect that you guys got to some, maybe not all, but some of these conclusions in your groups. So let's just look at them uh, one at a time here. So the number of sides, I think you guys wrote down this formula, right? Four uh, mn equals four times mn minus one, because we just kept multiplying by four in that first column. And the explicit version of that same phenomenon is just the original number of sides, which was three times four to the power of n. And the original number of sides is always going to be three because what do we start with? A triangle. So it doesn't matter whether it's a big triangle or a little triangle. The number of sides is just three times four to the n. And then we got to this next one, which was the length of each side. And what many of you recognize was that in the middle column, to find the lengths, we were just dividing by three. But uh, I'm going to keep writing that as a times. And so I'll write that as a times one third. So right there, one third times the previous length is the recursive formula. And then over here, the explicit version of that one um, says that you take the original side length of the seed and you multiply by one third raised to the n power. Okay. And then finally, the hard one, which I think some groups were just getting up to, not all groups have gotten to this, was the perimeter. Well, the perimeter actually is pretty straightforward if you understand how you built that last column. What did you do to, to the first two columns to make the perimeter in the last column? You just multiplied them, right? Didn't we multiply those two columns together? Number of sides times the length of each side. So if you have these highlighted formulas in yellow and blue, you can just multiply them together to get the new perimeter, right? So apparently, the yellow guy says times it by four, whatever the previous answer was times four. And the blue one says the previous answer times a third. So this perimeter one down here is going to be the product of those two things. We're going to times it by four and times it by a third. And so putting that all together gives us this four thirds as the common ratio. That's a times four and a divide by three with the four thirds. And so the explicit version over here says take the original perimeter and just times it by four thirds to a power. Okay, so let's see if we can make some conclusions based on this. Um, so let's just check uh, one quick calculation here. So suppose we were looking for the uh, perimeter of the step three caught snowflake. So this is one that's in your chart already. You have a number there in step three. What was the perimeter in step three? 64. Everybody see that number in the chart? Let's just see if this formula here in green gives us the 64 without going through the whole chart. So it says you, t you look at the perimeter of the seed. What was the perimeter of our seed? Perimeter was 27. So we're doing 27. And then times perimeter is this 4 thirds. And then it gets raised to a power. And it's the power of whichever level you're on. We're on the third level here, yes? So we raise this to the third power. And we get the 64. Yeah? And I think one of the questions that not everybody had gotten up to said, well, what's the perimeter if you're looking at the 10th triangle? I mean, I, I couldn't even imagine drawing such small triangles, but I can use this formula really easily, right? Just change the end to a 10 if we're doing the 10th triangle. And so the perimeter of that triangle is 479. I didn't ask, but, but what about the perimeter of the 100th triangle? What could I do to find the perimeter of the 100th triangle? So. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's as simple as just moving the previous answer over one. But we can change that n to 100. So this is the perimeter after 100 levels. What does that E13 mean? What does E mean? Times 10 to the 13. That's what that means. Let's calculate the E for exponent. And everything we do is base 10, so 10 to the 13th power, which means you take the decimal point and you move it which way? If I wanted to multiply this by 10 to the 13, and move it to the right, 13 places. So keep going to the end of this number and then probably a few zeros more after that. 
So the perimeter of the hundredth snowflake is some massive number. Maybe it's in the like trillions-ish. What do we think if we keep doing this forever? It's infinite, right? I mean, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger without bound. So the perimeter of this thing is infinity if you go forever, which actually is kind of surprising if you just pause to think about it. Uh, if I take a quick look at one of our pictures here. So if I were allowed to just carry this thing on forever, and I just said this is the picture, this is the infinite one gone forever, we would have no problem seeing this, right? It still wouldn't get any bigger than, you know, like up on the board, two feet by two feet, yes? But somehow, even, even if this thing were like on your piece of paper, the infinite version, if you were to try to walk around that thing or trace around that thing, how long would it take you? It would take you forever. Even if you're on this little two foot by two foot square, it has an infinite perimeter, which is kind of surprising that you can have something that has an infinite perimeter that's inside of a very small space, this two foot by two foot space. Okay, well, let's take a look at uh, the area side of things. So here, uh, we're going to do this part together, but can you guys jump back to page 32, one page back. So it turns out to do the same kind of calculations for area, we actually need a formula for the area of an equilateral triangle. Now, I know many of you guys know the formula for the area of any old triangle. What is it? Half base times height, right? That's the formula for the area of a triangle. And we have equilateral triangles. And so for our triangle, we had nines all the way around. So how long is the, is the base of our triangle? Nine. How long is the height of our triangle? We don't know, and this is the difficulty, right? Just because the side is nine, we don't really have the tools to figure out what the height of that triangle is. So I can't use my half base times height formula because I don't have the height. So it turns out that there's a nifty little formula that I will just share with you, and if you're interested in seeing why it's true, I can show you out uh, after class. Uh, but it is this. Uh, it is um, you take the side of the original triangle, S, you square it, and then you multiply by, uh, let me do it this way, divide by 4, multiply by the square root of 3. Can you guys write that formula? You take the side, S, you square it, you divide it by 4, you multiply by the square root of 3. So we will use this formula many times. You'll get comfortable with it, I promise. So that one I'm just giving you. There's no reason you should believe it to be true other than I've hardly lied to you, you know, like maybe a dozen times all semester. So, so probably that's true. So on the next page, it works. Good. Okay, so here's the idea. What we're going to do here is calculate the areas of each of our Koch snowflakes. Like at every seed, we're going to find the area. So a couple of these rows are already filled in. Let's see if we can figure out what's going on, and then we'll fill in a few more rows in our groups. So uh, the original row is just kind of an odd duck because it's just you're not adding anything. So the original seed row um, has a side length of 9. Yes, that was our original triangle. How many triangles are there in that case? Just the one. Then there's this formula. It says the approximate area of each triangle. So how would I find the area of a triangle where the sides are 9 all the way around? I would do that formula, that equilateral formula. So we'll do this up on the calculator here. Hopefully you can confirm this on your calculator at your table. So try this right now. But we're going to do our formula, which says we're supposed to take the side squared. So we go 9 squared. And then we're supposed to take that and do what? Divided by 4. And then times square root of 3. Now some of you might need to type that square root of 3 in the other order than what I typed it here. It depends on your calculator. But if you're doing it in the right order, you should get this 35.07. If you don't get 35.07, raise a flag and I'll come around in a bit. Are most, are most of us getting 35.07? Yes, I see a few thumbs up. Got more, good. Okay. All right, so um, I'm a mom. So keep going on this top row. 
the next column isn't going to make sense at the moment. It says total area added to previous snowflake. Don't worry about that. Area of snowflake at this step, 35.1. I'm just going to round to the nearest tenth. So is everybody comfortable with 35.1 is the first triangle? C triangle's area is 35.1. Okay, then we go to the next layer. And I ask myself, what is the side length of the triangles that you added in the next step? Started with a nine, but then you add some triangles. The new triangles have side length of three, yes? That was the second row in your chart. So that's the three. How many triangles did you actually add in that step? You added three, right? One to each of the sides of the original triangle. So that's the next three. Now we've got to do a calculation to find this number right here, which is supposed to be the area of each of those attached triangles. I'm going to do my same uh, S squared divided by 4 times root 3. But it's not 9 squared anymore. What is it? That's now 3 squared. 3 squared divided by 4 times the square root of 3. And I get that 3.897. That's the area of a single one of those triangles. But I want to know how much area we've added to the original triangle. So what do I do to this 3.89 to find the total added area? Times it by the three triangles that we just put in, yes? Because we have three copies of that 3.897. So we multiply. In fact, I'll even put this on the page here. We multiply that times that, and we put it right there. So that 11.691 is the total area of the three new triangles we just added. So now I want the area of the entire snowflake at this step. What do I do with that 11.7? <laughs> Add it to the 35 that we had before, right? Because we, we still have the original triangle plus another 11.7. And so then if I say here and here, and I write the word add, makes sense what I'm talking about there. Take the 11, add it to the 35, gets us the 46 and change. Okay, so what I'd really like for the next 10 minutes is for us to fill in as much of this table as we can. If you have any calculator issues, let me know. And definitely check in with each other. Don't go too far without checking in. If there's any mistake you make kind of carries through. All right, I have projected an Excel file. Can you guys read that in the back? All right, so here's our uh, Excel file. This is exactly what you guys are filling in, just uh, programmed in with all the formulas, and it's kind of nice because it's the same patterns every time, right? And so we can let Excel do the formula, the crunching. Um, so we started with a 35.1, then a 46.8, right? That was the next number. 51.9 or 52, did we get something around there? And then 54.3, 55.3, 55.7. I don't know if any group got past the 55.7. Are the numbers getting bigger or smaller? Bigger, but at a smaller and smaller rate, yes? yes. Like the gains every time are less than the gains the previous time. And it turns out if you let Excel calculate a bunch of these guys, and we're just looking at this last column here, what appears to be happening to these numbers it, it kind of looks like they're equaling each other. Do you think they're really equal to each other? No, if I had some more decimals, it would be a little bit different than each other. But basically, we're saying that the area of the infinite Koch snowflake is like less than 56.2. I mean, it, it's definitely not going to reach infinity or 5 billion or anything like that. Um, and so what makes that really nice, uh, that's not what I wanted. Um, what, what makes that really nice no, we'll come back to that next time. Um, so, uh, so we've got infinite uh, perimeter, but a uh, very small area. It turns out that the final area of the infinite Koch snowflake is always exactly 1.6 times the area of the original. I'll say it again. The infinite Koch snowflake area is exactly 1.6 times the original. Our original was the 35.1 area. So if you multiply that by 1.6, you'll get these numbers that we're getting down here at the bottom always times 1.6. Okay, so the last thing for today is actually something completely unrelated to fractals, but um, 
the other day, let's see, so on Wednesday, you guys remember we talked about annuities, equal payments over the course of year after year or month after month. So I kid you not, on Wednesday night, I was uh, watching an ESPN documentary series called 30 for 30. Anybody ever watched any of those? Pretty good, like 30 or 60 minute documentaries, and they're generally pretty good. And so I was watching this one called uh, Who Killed the USFL? And the USFL was the United States Football League, was a very short-lived 1983 to 1985 competitor of the NFL. It didn't last very long, um, but this was a documentary about the rise and, and very quick fall of this particular league. And so I'm watching this thing on Wednesday night, and uh, one of the big stars of this upstart football league is Steve Young. You guys know Steve Young from the NFL? Hall of Famer, if he's not already there, he certainly headed there. Uh, for the 49ers, so check this out. Uh, talks about his salary of $40 million. He was the $40 million man, so here it goes. This million dollar giveaway, they were just trying to get people in the stands. They said, somebody in the stands here is going to win a million dollars. But it wasn't just a million dollar check handed out up front. It was 50000 a year for 20 years, which is equal to a million dollars, right? But would you rather have uh, today a million dollars or 50000 a year for 20 years? You'd rather have it today because then you can invest it and it can grow, right? But it, the, the 50000 a year didn't start right now. When did it start? 20 In 20 years. Now, the fact is this league lasted for three years. Now, I don't know if this guy ever ended up getting – maybe he got paid. I don't know. I mean, it hasn't – like it's it's been 20 years, so maybe he started to collect. I'm not sure. Um, so, so what I was interested in – and we don't have time to do the calculation, so I will just give you the highlights and the, the net result of this calculation. I wanted to know, if somebody were to promise you 50000 a year for 20 years, starting in 20 years, what would that be equivalent to in terms of them handing you one check right now today and nothing ever again? That's what I want to know. What is it really worth to us today, this kind of gimmicky 50000 a year for 20 years in 20 years? So it is an annuity, and we have formulas for such things. So I used this uh, annuity formula right over here. Now I had to assume something about, I had to assume a certain interest rate. Now back in the mid 80s, interest rates were really high. Right now they're at historical lows, but in the mid 80s they were pretty close to historical highs. Best I could find, interest rates back then in 1984 were about 12% a year which seems like a crazy amount right now, but also inflation was keeping up with that. And so like, it, it, you know, like it was just, a, it, it didn't feel like a high interest rate. It just felt normal. So I figured out what the um, 50,000 a year for 20 years would grow to at the end of 20 years. And it turned out to be about like $3.4 million. Like at the end, if you invest your 50,000 a year every year for 20 years, you will have about 3.3 million at the end of the day after 20 years. But that's not in 20 years is actually in 40 years, right? Because there was this kind of lag. And so then I kind of back calculated and I used another formula that we have, uh, this guy right here. And I said, okay, 3.3 million is the future value, but I wanna know what the present value is. And it was over the course of 40 years. So I plugged in a 40 right up there for time. Any guesses as to what the one check today would be the same as this 50,000 for 20 years in 20 years? million. I want to know what could you uh, have invested, what could you invest in the bank today so that 40 years from now you would have the 3.3 million that you would have had according to this scheme? 12% interest. Guesses. Yeah, so it turned out to be about $38,000 was the, was the, so, so they advertise it as a million dollar giveaway. But in reality, assuming this 12% interest rate and the way that they kind of game the system here, it was equivalent of handing that guy a check for $38,000, which is not bad, especially back in the mid 80s, but it isn't the million dollars. It certainly isn't the million dollars that they were kind of advertising. Um, okay, so last thing, when you are doing your homework tonight, you're gonna be cursing me because you don't have grid paper. And I'm telling you right now, you have grid paper. It is the very first page of this packet, okay? So don't draw grid paper, don't go out and buy grid paper, don't ask in the studio, we don't have any grid paper in there. You have it, it's the very first page of this packet, okay? So when you are drawing stuff in your homework, go back to that page. We will see you guys Wednesday.